let's see how this goes. I got uh, an AI bot to write this speech. We'll see how it goes. All right. Uh, so today, half of you understood that joke, half of you went over your head. All right. Well, uh, today what I wanted to talk about is uh, the difference between faith and belief. Now, when I said that to someone else recently, they said, those are synonyms. Uh, are you really just using a word salad, talking like Jordan Peterson, maybe? Uh, no. Uh, I do think that there is a difference between faith and belief. And uh, I think that true religion focuses on faith over belief. Beliefs are important, but faith is even more important. So uh, where I got this distinction was from the late Professor Wilfred Cantwell Smith who said that there is this difference between faith and belief. So what do these two words mean? Well, he's defining belief as propositional affirmation of a fact. So for example, this lectern exists. Those chairs exist. It's Friday today. George Washington existed. These are facts of existence or facts of history. That's how some of us treat religion. We say, I believe that God exists. He is a fact of the universe, or really outside of the universe. And uh, if you talk to the so-called new atheists, they also understand religion in that way, that religion is about, they think faith means just belief, and it's unjustified belief, according to them. It's uh, just our fanciful, mythical understanding. But the reality is, is that uh, even Satan believed in God from a propositional intellectual sense. So Satan, according to scripture, was not an atheist, at least not uh, from an intellectual standpoint. So I think that there's something more important than belief, and that is faith. So faith is, wh whereas belief is something of the mind, of the brain, intellectual, faith is something that comes from the heart. It's a matter of the heart and the soul. So it's more than just one plus one equals two. Instead, faith is about trust and commitment, about reliance and trust. So, for example, I believe that my wife exists. She's a fact of the universe. I know that when I come home, she exists. But that's not what I mean. Uh, that's not what I mean when I say that I have faith in her and she has faith in me. It means something much more than that. It means that I trust her and she trusts me. That I rely on her and she relies on me. When the going gets tough, she's there for me. That's what faith means. And that's what I think matters when it comes to religion. So when, re when religious people commit their lives to God, what we are doing is we're dedicating our life to something beyond ourselves, to the transcendent, to the divine. And that's something more than just saying, I believe in God. Unfortunately, however, our religious establishment sometimes seems to just focus on belief as opposed to faith. It's really easy to check what a person's beliefs are. You can give them a, a checklist and say, do you believe in this, 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 and this? Okay, you can be part of our church, you can be part of our mosque. In fact, recently I visited Pakistan and I entered into a mosque and there was a sign that was over a doorway, which was a creedal statement meant to say that the people who belong to this mosque, this is what they believe. And anyone who doesn't believe that doesn't belong in this mosque and really doesn't belong in this country. That's kind of the message that was being sent. Well, again, I think that's a little bit of a misguided approach, you know, and, and you can talk about like creedal statements. Do you believe Jesus Christ has two natures, divine and human? Is he both fully God and fully human? Was Jesus one person or two? Do you believe the Quran is created or the uncreated word of God? Where does the Quran in here, inside of God or in some outside locus? These are beliefs. And these are things that often our religious establishment focuses on, but I don't think it's the real uh, fruit, the, the kernel of faith. It's just the husk of faith. Historically, of course, if you had the wrong set of beliefs, you could get in some serious trouble. You could be excommunicated from your church, from your mosque, your life could be in danger or at least you could face social ostracization. That's a tough word. Well, the Bible and the Quran, I would argue, focus on faith, not just belief. In a beautiful passage in Hebrews 11, we read, quote, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
the passage goes on to speak of the faith in God shared by the prophets, by Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, and Moses. The passage goes on to say, quote, By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Clearly, this is not propositional belief that is being talked about, but faith and trust in a higher power. Similarly, we read in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, we walk by faith. The Quran says in Surah 8, verse 2, quote, Only they are the believers, that is the faithful, whose hearts quake with fear when God is mentioned, and when his signs are recited unto them, they increase them in faith, and they trust in their Lord. You know, coming back to Pakistan, I think about, uh, in fact, when I visited a few years ago, there was this debate raging about where you place your hands in prayer. Do you wrap your hands around your chest as the ahl hadith do, or do you put it next to your navel like the Hanafis do? Just a matter of a few inches, but that could actually cause, you know, pretty heated arguments. People could come to blows on this topic. But what does the Quran say about such differences in ritual? In fact, the Quran says in Surah 2, verse 177, quote, It is not piety to turn your faces toward the east and west. And this is talking about a debate that was happening at this time about which direction to turn in prayer. So the Quran is saying that's not what the really important part is. So it says, It is not piety to turn your faces toward, east, or, uh, toward the east and west. Rather, piety is he who believes in God the last day the angels, the book, and the prophets, and those who give wealth despite loving it to kinsfolk, orphans, the needy, the traveler, beggars, and for the emancipation of slaves, and performs the prayer and gives the alms to the poor, and those who fulfill their oaths when they pledge them, and those who are patient in misfortune, hardship, and moments of peril. It is they who are sincere, and it is they who are the reverent. In order for this passage to really make sense, I think we need to understand even the beliefs that are mentioned here, that is, believing in God, the last day, the angels, the book, and the prophets, again, is something more than just propositional affirmation. Rather, it's referring to a deep dedication to and a faith and commitment to all of these things. The Quran is talking about true piety, and it's something more than just formalistic ritual or legalism. It is instead deeply intertwined with social justice and ethical behavior or the social gospel, as Christians would say. If we were to construct a list of piety as understood by many of the people in our religious establishment today, I'd argue we'd get a very different list. It would be, how much Quran have you memorized? How long is your beard? Are your pants above your ankles? I mean, uh, I remember I was at an Islamic conference a few years ago, and there was a stall where they were selling uh, wudu-proof or compliant uh, finger polish. Uh, or nail polish. And I just thought, is this really what it's come down to? And today, even in the Friday khutbah, uh, the imam was very concerned and told us, this is true, this just happened today. I had to add it into the speech, or the AI bot added it in. Uh, he was saying that, brothers, we need to be really careful that when we go in sajda, our toes should point to the qibla. I just thought, wow, this is something that serious. But um, so. I think what we really need to focus on is true righteous piety, and that's what the Quran is talking about. For example, how often do we Muslims talk about orphans and taking care of orphans? That's such a big deal in the Quran. The Prophet Muhammad was an orphan himself. The Quran continuously says to take care of the orphans. Yet if you look at the foster care organizations, and my wife worked for one before, actually you find out that there's a lack of Muslim families to place Muslim kids in to, to house Muslim kids. And these organizations, which are secular, non-Muslim, they actually are desperately trying to find Muslim families to put these kids in their homes. And sometimes they're forced to put them in non-Muslim homes. That just shows how I think we've kind of misdirected our religion. Now, that's not to say that beliefs don't have a place, that ritual doesn't have a place. All of these things have a place. But I think it's just the emphasis that we have gotten wrong. Um, even in the Quran, it talks about ritual slaughter. And actually it criticizes the Arabian pagans for they had these very complex rules and prohibitions about how to conduct their ritual slaughter. And the Quran actually says in Surah 22, 30, verse 37, nine, it's talking about how to actually do the slaughter. And it says, 
neither their flesh, that is of the animal, neither their flesh nor their blood will reach God, but the, but the reverence from you reaches him. That's really what's important. Actually, when the, uh, the, Bi the biblical and Quranic turn was actually away from this idea that in the pagan times, there was this idea that you just need to do the ritual in the exact right way and your offering would be accepted. It just it was like a recipe that you follow and as long as you follow it, you'd be okay. But what the biblical and Quranic turn did was it turned away from that and focused more on the inner state of the person doing that ritual and the ethical behavior of that person. According to uh, the scholar of Islamic law, Joseph Lowry, the Quran actually endorses legal min minimalism. And I actually agree with him here. If you look at Surah 6, uh, he comments, actually, Dr. Lowry comments on Surah 6 and says, quote, the Quranic dispensation seeks to unburden the Quranic community from needless legislative restrictions, unquote. So in fact, the Quran was engaging with the uh, customs of the Arabian pagans. They had all of these intricate rules and regulations, and the Quran says that these don't have any warrant from God, and they're needlessly complex. Instead, the Quran simplifies all of these things and declares actually that nothing is forbidden except swine, blood, ro roadkill or carrion, and anything that's offered to an idol. So it really simplified all of these things. And even when it talks about uh, Jewish or uh, the Jewish oral law, the Quran says that actually now we've kind of lessened the burden on you and simplified things. So um, basically the Quran is minimizing these things and emphasizing ethical behavior. Unfortunately, later in our tradition, I think we went in the opposite direction. And Dr. Lowry comments on this as well, that we went towards legal maximalism. Now, of course, you could say, can't we do both? Uh, that's something, yes, we, we, there is a place for ritual. There is a place for ethical behavior. But I think that as human beings, we have limited cognitive decision-making capability. So I think of uh, Mark Zuckerberg back in the day, he, or even now, he wears a great t-shirt, just a great t-shirt every day. He's a billionaire, but he wears a great t-shirt every day to work. He was asked, why is that the case? He said, well, I'm the CEO of Facebook and I have to make dozens or hundreds of decisions every day. And I don't want to waste any of that cognitive decision-making uh, capacity on what clothes I'm going to wear in the morning. Well, I think it's very similar when it comes to our ethical and religious behavior. If we're always worried about these formal, fine, you know, r really trivial matters, I don't think we have le much left in the tank to focus on those wider things, especially when it comes to social justice and, and that kind of thing. So if you're worried about, okay, I need to enter into the room with my right foot, I need to sit here, even how you sit on the toilet and what direct, all of this thing, you really have nothing left. And, and you can kind of see that, that there is this kind of, I, I often saw when I, uh, that it's sometimes the people who are less religious who are focused on social justice and these things, and people who are extremely religious can kind of get distracted from those things. So I think we need to kind of refocus ourselves uh, when it comes to how we uh, implement our religion. So even if we look at the Quran, the Quran does not contain complex legal codes. And furthermore, it does not contain uh, complex theological creeds in it. It's a very simple theological belief in the Quran. The Quran focuses on faith, virtue, and the doing of good deeds. In fact, the minimum to, uh, for salvation, according to the Quran, is to believe in God, the last day, and to do righteous deeds. It's not a complex theology. It's not the Nicene Creed or these creeds the, uh, that uh, even we Muslims have. So uh, neither is it the case that, in the, uh, according to the Quran, that you can just recite such and such thing in such, at such and such time and all your sins are going to be forgiven this kind of idea that you just recite the, some magical formula or do this magical thing and your sins are forgiven. Instead, the focus is on uh, righteous behavior and ethical conduct. So um, I wanted to uh, close with saying that religion ultimately is about loving God and loving God's creation. As it says in the Gospels, of, uh, Jesus is asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answers Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Than these. And similarly, the Quran, when it's talking about uh, belief, it's talking, when it's talking about faith, this is what it says. Say, truly my prayer and my sacrifice, my living and my dying are for God, Lord of the worlds. Clearly, this is something more than just propositional belief. So I wanted to circle back to that, the difference between faith and belief. If we focus our religion simply on beliefs, then I think it also interferes with our interfaith work because we all have different beliefs. And even amongst Muslims, we have different beliefs. That it can sometimes be very divisive. But if we focus on faith, we all share the commitment to faith in the transcendent, faith in something beyond us. And that unites us. The Quran declares in Surah 49, verse 13, O humankind, verily we created you from a male and a female, and we made you peoples and tribes that you may come to know one another. Surely the most noble of you in the sight of God are the most piously righteous of you. If we define religion as belief here, then many Muslims would think that this verse is only talking about Muslims, that only Muslims can be piously righteous. But this characteristic of righteous piety, taqwa, is shared across humankind, which is why the verse is addressed to humankind. It doesn't say, oh, you Muslims, it says, oh, humankind. It addresses all the tribes and uh, all the peoples and tribes of the, of the world. Indeed, I would say that we Muslims have often failed to understand the very point of religion. We think the goal is to become Muslim, that that's the end point. Our job is to go out there and convert as many people as we can get another score for Team Islam, collect as many converts as we can, like Pokemon. But that's not really what religion is about. Religion is about Islam itself. Capital I, Islam is not the goal. Islam is what allows us, if we follow it properly, to become uh, righteously pious. That is the goal, not just being part of the religion. And Islam itself is really about the existential state of Al-Islam. Al-Islam translates to submission, submission to the will of God. This is an existential state. It's not just something that comes from the tongue. I'm going to summarize now. I think we've made religion about beliefs when it really is about faith. I think we've made religion about intricate laws and rules when it's really about ethics and virtues. Now, there are rules and laws. I'm not saying that there is no place for them at all, but I think we have uh, mixed up the emphasis. We have made religion into formal and rote observance of ritual when it's really about spiritual transformation and the humbling of the self. That's what prayer is meant to do, to turn you away from the self-centeredness, the ego-centeredness, to the other-centeredness, to the God-centeredness. We've made religion into just saying the right formula at the right time when it's really about being a good person, of loving God, of loving his creation, and of doing good on this earth. We've made religion into a competition to win converts when it's really about converting our own hearts and striving to engage in a spiritual contest to do good. We have made religion into reading the book with the beautiful voice when it really is about reading the book to understand its beautiful message and to implement it in our lives. We've made it simply about being Muslim when it really is about striving to die in a Muslim state, in a submitting state. The truth is that we've only grasped the husk the empty shell of religion, but we really should be seeking the true kernel of faith. Thank you.